And uh, I, I'm going to talk about the Word. We've been talking about uh, Ephesians chapter 6 and the full armor of God. We've gotten to, through two of them, and I'm going to talk about the third one today, which is the loin belt of truth. So, Lord, I thank you for your people that press in and are willing to hear what you have to say. We thank you for your word, which is the truth, and that you give us the energy and the love to just continually fall deeper and deeper in love with you and with your word. We will hide it in our hearts that we will not sin against you. Lord, we, we hide your word inside of us. We treasure it because it gives us peace. It, it perfects us because it, it is flawless and never ending. We'll never get to the bottom of it. There's always more to learn about your word. So we put aside distractions right now and we say, help us to hear what you want to say to us today in Jesus' name. Amen. So my text verse is going to be Psalm 119, verse 11. And one of the versions that I read says, the treasure of your word, right? I will, I will hide it like in the treasury of my heart. I will put your word in there. And that's what defends my heart from sin. Because sin is missing the mark and it's, and it's believing a lie. And the word of God is truth. And we're, we're alive at a time today that's been more chaotic in our culture than in my whole lifetime. So if ever we needed truth in the midst of chaos, we need it now. So I don't think we can go too, too long and too hard on, on trying to help people fall in love with the word of God. I've been encouraging people to just use it on their phone. Get a Bible program on your phone. Turn it on during the day while you're working. Have the Gospels, have the Book of Acts running in the background. Have uh, the life of David. There's just so many chapters on him. Keep it on the front burner of your life, and you'll, you'll be amazed how the Holy Spirit will connect what you're processing with what you need to know that day. Amen? You believe that? Yeah. All right, so here's the text. It says, I have treasured your word in my heart so that I may not sin against you. Can you say it with me? I have treasured your word in my heart so that I may not sin against you. That, if you get nothing else, think of your heart as a vault. And the treasure is God's word in your heart. It's not just in your mind. The Bible says guard your heart, for out of your heart flow the issues of life. And this is where the contending happens between my will which can be carnal, my carnal nature, the devil's voice or God's voice. There's all these kingdoms trying to compete with each other, and we bow our knee to the King of kings and Lord of lords, and the truth of the Bible sets us free. You shall know the truth. Daniel Amstutz, when he was here, likes to say, it's only the truth you know that will set you free. <laughs> You can have it up here floating around in your head, but if you don't believe it, then you know, that's where this disconnect happens. Because your actions are based on what you believe, not what you say. And in the voice version, it says, how can a young man, woman, how can a young person remain pure? Say it, only by living according to your word. Can you imagine back in the day when they were denying people access to the Bible? because they said you'd get too confused. Well, man, I got a lot more confused without it. I sure wish I would have had it. You know, if, if you have your children in, in Sunday school from the time they're little, like, wasn't it beautiful seeing them come up here and dance today? Like, wow, if you're sowing the seed into their hearts at that age and 50 times a year, even when you go on vacation, right, you're planting that seed, you're helping them memorize scripture, they're learning songs, and the songs are full of scripture, and they don't even realize what that's doing for the core of their foundation to know the truth. And they're going to be presented with many lies in their lives. And we're here to help the next generation not fall victim to the lies, but they live in a very different world than we lived in when we were growing up. So it's our job as the older generation to make sure we translate the truth in a way that they can apply it to their lives today. Because you didn't have half the temptations they have today. So talk to them. Get to know them. We're, we're held accountable for how we help other people know the word, especially us as the leaders who really are. But, you know, it says let the older women help the younger women in the church, right? It doesn't just happen. You don't just get a download. And for many of us, if we weren't raised in a Christian home, 
you, you heard the conversation at the table, but these days they hear the conversation at the table and they Google whatever you're talking about. And Google has more influence than the parents have. That's not good. So we have to stand in the gap, amen? What a privilege to sow the truth of the word into the lives of the young people. But if you want to remain pure, it's only by living according to the word of God. I've pursued you, the psalmist says. I've pursued you with my whole heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. Deep within me, I have hidden your word so that I, not, I will not sin against you. Deep within me, I have hidden your word so that I might not sin against you. We don't know for sure who wrote Psalm 119, but, but David did so many heroic acts. But there was a time when he came to an inflection point. There was a decision that he had to make. He walked out on the roof and deep in my heart, I have hidden your word, but there wasn't enough in there to keep him from looking over that ledge and staying there and looking at that woman taking that bath. Right? So as great as he was, as much word as he had in him, it's when you need it that matters. So you have to deposit it before you need it. <laughs> and if there's anything I could do to help you fall more in love with the word of God, I'm all in. I want you to know how to study the Bible, how to use the tools, all free tools online. It's amazing what's available today. But there's also 10 billion other trans, uh, what? things that would try to confuse you, other options, other, other ways that the enemy would, would try to bait you into staying away from the word. He doesn't care what he uses as long as you stay away from the truth of the word. But we should be holding each other accountable. Amen? That's, that's what we were talking about with those micro groups. And there was 120 women in here yesterday for the women's breakfast. Thank you, Lord. So I think there should be some women's micro groups going on, too. And I said to one of the ladies, I bet you in the first half hour, there was more words spoken in the women's breakfast than five men's breakfasts <laughs> for three hours. And she said, amen, that's exactly right. <laughs> and the men come in, what's up? Yeah, good, man, it's good. It's awesome, it's awesome. The microgroups are so key. You, you have to trust people. You have to know that you can open up your heart and that your business is not going to be spread around. What happens in those groups stays there. But we hold each other accountable. We hold each other up in prayer. We call each other up. How are you doing? Everything okay? So key. The community of the body of Christ is, is such an immune system defense for us to know that we're in community with each other. All right, so then, I love this. This was a song I learned as a new Christian. I was an adult when I got saved at 25, so this is one of the first songs that I heard about this particular Psalm 19. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Isn't that a beautiful way to say it? Even a simple person who doesn't have a lot of education, the truth of the word breaks through. It finds a way to break through. There was a lady named Jackie Pullinger that had a ministry in Hong Kong. She left England as a teenager, went all the way to Hong Kong with a one-way ticket. And she started teaching English over there and became a missionary. She got filled with the Spirit. And she was laying hands on these young uh, heroin addicts. They were 11, 12, 13 years old. They had already been hooked on heroin in the streets of Hong Kong. And they started prophesying. When they got filled with the Spirit of God, they started prophesying Scripture. But they couldn't even read Okay? People would try to donate computers. She said, computers? We didn't even have electricity. You don't understand who, what, what the people that we're dealing with here. And the triads there, they call them the triads, were the organized crime. And they would see her, and they thought when she first got there, oh, you'll be like everybody else. She'll be gone in a few months because it's a difficult place. And then they got up upset with her because she was getting so many of the heroin addicts healed that they were losing their clients. But then three years went by, and they held a meeting with her, and they said, you know what? At first, we were going to try to get you out of here, but we think what you're doing for this neighborhood is really good. So we want to partner with you. Man, God will even make your enemies. You'll find favor with them. It's incredible. So, look, the law of the Lord is perfect. It restores, revives our soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure. It makes wise the simple. More to be desired are they. The promises of God, the truth of Scripture. More to be desired than money. Yes. America needs to hear that one. Yes, because if you have the truth of the word, you'll make more money. 
If you apply God's principles in the marketplace, we could talk about this quite a bit. You'll succeed because no boss wants to hire a liar. And sweeter than the honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. How important. How important, just in the course of our day, what we're meditating on is going to direct what's coming out of our mouth. And if we're meditating on the word, good thoughts, think on these things, scripture. And then in Psalm 73, it says, if I had given in to my pain and spoken of what I was really feeling, can anybody relate? To be in one of those situations. And I know most of us have probably been betrayed in our lives. You trusted somebody and then you found out that you got scammed. Or that old song, I remember, everybody plays the fool. No exception to the rule. Remember that one? And like when you're the one that you feel you got played and you're the fool, you feel betrayal. And if you're Sicilian, not good things rise up in your spirit. <laughs> I am, so I can tell you what happens there. I'm not picking on them. I just am one. So you automatically think, I've, I need retribution. I have, to, I have to take vengeance. That's what a man would do. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. They go for more than your eye. That's not the right. That's not God's way of doing it. So you, you can't expect to get out of that cycle if you keep returning violence for violence. you got to find a better way, and God has a better way. If I had given in to my pain and spoken of what I was really feeling, you don't have to speak it out of your mouth. You could be feeling it, but you can allow the word of God to override that. You can ask the spirit of God to say, you be the dispatcher in my heart. I'm not going to look for that warehouse of the flesh. I'm going into the, the warehouse of the word and the spirit, and I'm going to speak life over this situation, not the death that I'm sensing for being betrayed and I want to take vengeance. He said vengeance is saith the Lord, not Peter Roselli. If I had done that, it would have sounded like unfaithfulness to the next generation. When I tried to understand it all, I just couldn't, right? So now I just talked about the faithfulness to the next generation. It's one of the best ways our young people can grow is by seeing us model it. Not just hearing sermons and teaching tapes. Those are great. We need them. But what about just them watching our lives and seeing the gospel lived out as we interact with each other? Say amen. amen. Things will go well for you if you say amen. <laughs> it was too puzzling, too much of a riddle. I couldn't do it. When I tried to understand it, it was just too puzzling. And, and you're just grinding and grinding. And you, an hour goes by and you got nothing done because this thing is renting space in your head. But then one day, whew, I was brought into the sanctuaries of God, and in the light of glory, my distorted perspective vanished. <laughs> what a power that is. And it's free. If you have a phone, pull it up on your phone for free. Bible Hub, Bible Gateway, it's all there for you. But the other distractions are, are competing for your attention. And that's why we need each other. Stay sharp in the word. Stay sharp in the truth and the principle of the word. And don't be legalistic. Because the letter of the law without the spirit, what? Kills. So it's the combination of the letter and the spirit. The Father is seeking for those who will worship him in both spirit and truth. So I have a long message that I won't get into all of that now. But I, I, I hope... Uh, Try to do a part two next week. And look, if we spend the whole service just praying for people, that's fine too. You know what? We're to just be open to what he's telling us and directing us. We're not going to get it always right all the time. I get that. But that's why they pay me the big bucks. <laughs> to do the best we can to hear the Lord, okay? And we're open. We're open to your input and, and anything you see, especially be the Bereans. If something we're saying doesn't line up with your understanding of Scripture, you've got every right to say, where, what's the scripture on that one? What chapter and verse are you looking at there, right? Okay, so we want that. And we want more than anything else, really, to you, for you to fulfill the calling that God has for you. And only he knows it, but he'll show the body of believers. We're like brothers and sisters in a family, and we love each other. No sibling rivalries here. 
we're, we're out for the best for everybody here, and hopefully you're out, the best, out for the best for us. Because if your leaders are hearing from the Lord and not getting distracted, they're going to guide the ship in the right direction. So the treasure of your word defends my heart from sin. How shall a young man, a young woman, cleanse their ways? Only by following the Lord's instructions. And sin is just missing the mark. It's an archery term, right? You aimed, but you missed. That's not condemnation in the Lord, but it's saying, I want to aim higher. I want to do better the next time. I want to keep working this into my metabolism so that I automatically do what God would want me to do in that situation. I've hid your word in my heart so that I will not sin against you. It's a treasure, and you can't get to the bottom of the book. So I just thought I would tell you a couple things. I mean, when I met my wife, I knew that she had already memorized a whole bunch of scripture. She was saved before I was, and she was already out in ministry doing things. And I was really impressed because, you know, like if you're chasing hard after the devil before you get saved, you know that you have to chase hard after God when you do get saved. You can't live in this decaffeinated version. You're either in or don't bother because it doesn't work that way, right? So what were some of the lessons that I learned? She gave me a book when, we, when I was still newer in the Lord, and, and we started dating. And I don't remember exactly when she gave it to me, but... I was reading her version of it. It was called The Hiding Place. And it was about this family. The man on the left is the father. His name is Casper Ten Boom. And that's his two, two of his daughters. He had other children too. But one is Betsy. The first one you see in the middle is the older sister. And then Corey is the, is the one on the right next to her, the younger sister. And, and Hebrews 12 one says, We have all of these great witnesses who encircle us like clouds. Right? And Hebrew 11 just went through this whole long list. So now you get to verse 1 of Hebrews 12, and he says, basically, since we have them, let's consider our walk. We can aim higher. And the thing that hit me about this family was there was nothing. Like, they didn't have any long Bible college experience. They didn't go away to ministry school. They were, it was in the 30s when, when the Germans came into Holland and, and took over. And as she's telling her story, Corey Ten Boom, it's like a different world. They had breakfast together every day. And they would read the Bible every day at the breakfast table. The father would read the Bible. And then every night at dinner, the father would read the Bible. And they would go to church. And that was it. And when time comes all these years later, they're still living together. These two sisters didn't marry. They stayed with the father, and, and they just had this really beautiful core family going. They knew the word inside out, and they had talked to each other and their church members about how would we apply it. So now they're put in a position, what do we do about the, the Jews that are being persecuted here? And some of the Christians in Holland said, well, just read your Bible. They said, let his blood be on our hands. So they're under a curse. Hmm. Casper said, yeah, but they gave us the Bible. <laughs> the book I read every day is the history of the Jewish people. And Jesus was a Jew. <laughs> so he would start wearing a star to identify with them, even though he wasn't Jewish by birth. But he built a hiding place in the house. They risked their lives. You, you, I won't tell you the story. You go read it. It's an amazing book. It sold millions of copies for that reason. But what would we have done? That's the big question, right? What if I was in that position? Would I have been Schindler? Or would I have looked the other way? I can't answer that question. But I can tell you there's a whole lot more people who think they would have been Schindler. That won't be. Because it's, this is willing to risk your life. And they did. And that's what it says in, in Hebrews 11 earlier than that. It said, they, lost, this is, they didn't talking about the Ten Boom family here. In Hebrews 11, it's a long list of people, of all the heroes of faith. That's what it's called, the Hall of Faith in the Bible. It's Hebrews 11. It says, they lost everything they possessed. They endured great affliction, and they were cruelly mistreated, which is also exactly what happened to these people. Corey Ten Boom did survive and wrote the book and then had a ministry. That's the only way we would have known about it. Truly, the world was not even worthy of them not realizing who they were. Think of that. Think of how profound that is. The culture of the world is so depraved 
They keep wanting to reject God. It's right in Psalm chapter 2, the second Psalm. Why do the heathen rage? Because they don't want God telling them what to do. My body, my choice, not God's. Go ahead. You want to do that? Go ahead. You're just not going to flourish the way you would if you listened to him. Oh, that's a long discussion, isn't it? So really, you would say that this family, by just reading the Bible every day and going to church, were, were filled with more courage than the other people because they believed the book. They acted on what they believed. And if we would do that, church, I'm telling you, the culture will shift. But if we don't, then it's going in the way wrong direction especially the way the children are being treated in the curriculums in the schools. And why not run for office? Why not run for your local school board? Maybe you don't have the time, but we want to help people get involved because we don't want to just complain about it and then not do anything about it. You're not all called to do that. I get that. But we're a body of believers that doesn't want to say, on my watch, that's what it says right here, steal our inheritance, not on my watch. Don't get a lot of amens on that one, huh? <laughs> so I'll take you through some of the armor, right? It says, finally, my brethren, this is Ephesians chapter 6, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, the lies, the plans, the strategies of the devil. For we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this age, and against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So there's spiritual warfare being described for you right there, but many churches and many Christians in America don't believe that this is for today. It's amazing to me. I mean, having come out of a drug culture that I was in before I got saved, I was seeing spirits all the time. So it wasn't hard for me to believe it at all. I was just glad I was on the right team now. And Holy Spirit and angels, like, yeah, I sure could have used some of that help. And I'm sure they did, like Sammy was saying. Like his, he passed out at the wheel while he was getting off the exit on Route 21. Christine didn't know where he was. And then she called his number, and a stranger picked up his phone. And, and the guy was like, I don't know who you are, lady. I just bought this phone from somebody. So they had already stolen his phone. They could have mugged him and stole his car. Right, and man, that, that, that raised up a line on the inside, like, oh, no, no, devil, you're not getting my husband, right? But for a while there, we didn't know where he was, but we were praying, we were believing, we were standing in the gap. It's spiritual warfare, and we put our eyes on the person. It's not the person who's the enemy. It's the spirit that's driving them, and God has a greater spirit, and if they get saved, they'll get so many people saved because they're so mean. People will know there's no other way they could have changed. What happened to you? I've been delivered. <laughs> no better thing. I've been delivered. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God. He says it again in verse 13, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. It's an evil day, church. In America, it's an evil day. Things we used to take for granted are not being taken for granted anymore. And having done all to stand, stand therefore having girded your waist with truth. All right? Now, Two weeks ago, we did the sword of the spirit, and we said the word there is rhema, which can mean spoken word of God. So Dutch Sheets is the person I heard teach this first, and he said, it's not the sword until you speak it. <laughs> you can look into that on your own. Bible Hub, great Greek dictionary. You can go study it. Speak the word of God, and then above all, the shield of faith. And I said last week that that was like a covering. Like we said, Jehovah Nisi today, we heard that prayer. It's a banner over us. It's our shield. But there's, a, there's something about faith that has a forward movement. So you need a shield in front of you because the enemy is going to be attacking you, and you're the first ones going in. That shield isn't protecting you as you're retreating. You go in with the shield that's customized to you. And you have enough faith to get through it. And then this loin belt is, is how it's called in the King James. It's holding all the other armor together. And the truth of the word will hold your life together. That's what I said here. It's like a belt. You would put the equipment on and then the belt would hold it all together. And I'm not going to get too deep into it today, but, but we will touch on this. We know Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. So Jesus is what holds everything together in our life. If you're not sure what to do, keep studying the word. Keep studying the word. Talk to other people in the church. We have some amazing 
ministers in this church that do prayer ministry that can help you wind through the different alleys of your life. Zip the lip. They don't say anything to anybody. My wife doesn't even tell me what, what happens in the counseling room because I don't need to know. And if I do need to know, it can be spoken in a general way that nobody ever has to feel like their privacy is being violated. And if you don't have that, you have nothing. You have to be able to trust that it's safe. There's no cost. <laughs> Swipe your card if you want ministry. You know, like, I can't do it. I know there's people that make a living doing that. That's fine. But this is the church. <laughs> okay? Anyway, another day's topic. And then, this, you might slip by this verse and miss what Peter's saying. He said, you've been reborn, not from seed that eventually dies, but from seed that is eternal through the word of God. The word is eternal, that lives and endures forever. So you've been reborn through the word of God. You see it? Reborn through the word of God. That lives and endures forever. So don't make it a legalistic exercise. Some people say they call it their devotions, and it can get kind of boring. If, you're, if your devotions are boring, come up for prayer. Today, we have a prayer line here every service because I can get it. I can understand why that, how that could happen. But we'll try to spark that. You have to ask the Holy Spirit to help you understand what you're reading and to show you what he wants you to know about what you're reading. Oh, I have so much to say. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just going to take you, I think, um, to the book of Revelation at the end because of the time. And I'll touch on some of this next time I speak, which hopefully will be next week. But in this church... Somebody else might be visiting, and we don't know, right? I love to speak, but we also like having other people speak, too, especially my wife. What do you think? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to say um, in Ephesians, right, it's Ephesians 6 where we see about this whole armor of God that's listed. Ephesus was a city of 250,000 people. Right? It was one of the biggest cities in that Roman Empire at the time. So when you're a port city and you got 250,000 people, there's a lot of sin. Okay, there's some really advanced demons in that place. You can even feel it when you go under the, uh, the Hudson River. When you get into New York, the, the demons are bigger than New Jersey. Now, they're big here too. Okay, they're big here too. <laughs> But you know what I mean? Like you can get out of the subway and walk up and you just feel this oppression depending on what neighborhood you're in, right? So, I mean, not in Brooklyn with the Italian restaurants. That's an anointing for food right there. <laughs> Whew. So Paul is told to go to Ephesus. It's a big, mean old city with a lot of sin. He doesn't care. It's like the bigger they are, the harder they fall. And it says God did amazing miracles through Paul. As if a regular miracle is not enough, he did amazing miracles, right? Like, wow. People would take a handkerchief or an article of clothing that, he had that had touched Paul's skin, bring it to their sick friends or relatives, and the patients would be cured of their diseases or released, delivered from evil spirits that oppressed them. Everyone was shocked and realized that the name of Jesus was powerful. But you're his ambassador. So when you speak in the name of Jesus, you are powerful too. Step out. That's what it is. Step out in faith. As a result, a number of people involved in various occult practices came to faith. And they confessed their secret practices and rituals. This is called revival. Some of them had considerable libraries about their magic arts. And they piled up the books and burned them publicly. Imagine that. 50,000 silver coins worth of books. They torched it. The whole city of Ephesus would have said, oh, there's a fire. Yeah, the strongholds are coming down. Those strongholds are coming down. Nobody told them to burn it. They knew inside we've been following a lie. We got to burn this. Don't give it to somebody else. Don't give your old rock and roll records to somebody else. Give them to the garbage man and break them up. That's what I had to do. There's no record. I know, records is old-fashioned. I get it. But I knew when I got saved, there was no way I was going to give those albums to anybody else. There were so many spirits on those albums. I, I called the office because my family's in the garbage business. I said, where's the truck? It's on Elmwood and Chestnut Street. Boom, right in the back of the truck. I made sure that it all got broken. So nobody would listen to Friend of the Devil by the Grateful Dead. Like, enough said. 50,000 silver coins. So here it is, verse 20. Word spread, and the message of the Lord overcame resistance. And the word spread powerfully. And then you see, there's a line here. 
Because the devil doesn't just roll over and say, okay, you can have the territory. He's going to push back. That's okay. So, an idol maker. Nice job, huh? What do you want to be when you grow up? <laughs> an idol maker. <laughs> he had a profitable business. His name's Demetrius. He was making shrines for Artemis, which you also probably know as Diana. Some, some Bible versions say it's the Temple of Diana, but in the Greek, uh, they called it Artemis. And that was one of the de deities that was worshipped. And this is what's still left of the Temple of Artemis. So it was a pretty big place, pretty big deal. It was considered one of the seven wonders of the world at the time. This is what an artist's rendering looks like, what they thought it was based on the ruins. So there's some big demons hanging in that place, let me tell you. So you're not going in there with a little firecracker. you got to bring the cannon, right? you, you got to bring the big weapons in. That's called spiritual warfare. We're not wrestling against the flesh and blood, but principalities, powers, and rulers of darkness. So if you're going to engage in this battle, you can't be decaf. you got to be special forces. you got to take this seriously. You can't be in sin and go in and think you're going to cast out a demon out of somebody. That happens in Scripture, the seven sons of Sceva. Paul we know, Jesus we know. Who the heck are you? And they run away naked. That's a weird picture, huh? And this guy says, look, we're all in a fine line of work. We're making a good living, but we better wake up or we're all going to go broke. You go woke or you go broke. The church can't go woke. Another day's title. You heard about this fellow Paul here in Ephesus. He's already convinced a large number of people to give up their idols. He tells us that our products are worthless. Yes, they're worthless. They have no power. God has power. The God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one, and you shall love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Be playing around with the Ouija board. Hmm. He's been doing this almost everywhere in Asia. Can you believe it? He's got it in for us. It's bad enough that he's slandering our honorable profession. <laughs> But do you see that where this will lead? If his lies, this is Paul. Demetrius is saying if Paul's lies catch on, the temple of Artemis itself will be called a fraud. Good. That's what it is. The great goddess of our region, the majestic deity who's revered here in Asia and around the world will be disgraced. And it goes on and there's a big riot. And I won't go into it all again. I could touch on it next week. But I just want to get to Revelation. Because before, I'll just read this one. It says, why are we putting on our lives on the line all the time if there's no resurrection? Right? That's Paul speaking. He says, but if I have fought against wild beasts in Ephesus. <laughs> now, the, at the time th that they were alive, they would have understood what that meant. That when you were, a Christian was being sacrificed, executed, they would bring him to the Colosseum. And they had these stadiums where they would bring the animals up from underneath. And the lions would come out. If you saw Gladiator, right, you, you might know what I'm talking about. We were actually in a place in Italy that was one of those stadiums back in the day. And we were one of the first people that was allowed down in the catacombs underneath. And you could feel it. You could feel the sacrifices that were being made, right? Trisha's nodding in her head. It was like really palpable. So when he says fighting the wild beasts, it doesn't mean he was actually in the, in the Colosseum fighting. It was the spiritual warfare that was going on because the demons in Ephesus did not want to let go. And we have to be careful that we don't get scared by this, okay? you got people around you that can help train you. Don't be spooked by this stuff. It's true. It's real that you have to be careful and you have to know your authority and you don't want to be a novice. You want to know who's laboring among you, but don't back off from being trained. That's why we're doing this prophetic class, right? So you can be trained. We're about the work of the Father's business. We're equipping the saints for the work of your ministry. Stella, you got a great ministry. Built right in, right? Amazing, isn't it? It's so great. I hear about it all the time. Some human cause. What good is that to me? If I've been putting my life on the line and I battled these demon spirits in Ephesus, the only reason it matters is because there's a resurrection. I don't care what men can do to me in this world. There's nothing they can give me that's going to match what I will have on the other side. I'm getting a new body. I'm going to be a resurrected man on the other side. Come on, bring it on, devil. 
Because you got nothing that compares to what I'm going to have in the future life, but also the people that get free in this life. Yeah. Nothing better you could do for somebody. Again, I'm just going to keep going. But that's where we were in Italy. This was one of the where, places where they had the catacombs underneath. You could feel it. Keep going. I'm going to just get to Revelation. Okay, in, in Revelation chapter 2, it's the first letter to the seven churches. So Ephesus is listed as the first letter when, when we hear about the letters coming out. It says, I know your deeds, your tireless labor, and your patient endurance. I know you do not tolerate those who do evil. Well, this is pretty good. For that city, for this kind of a compliment, this means the church really built up. In whatever time that was there in the difference between when Revelation is spoken and when Paul first got to Ephesus, something big really happened. They did a great work of building that church. They got a lot of pagan people saved. And now the angel is speaking, verse 1 out of the 7, and he says, I know you don't tolerate those who do evil. Furthermore, you have diligently tested those who claim to be emissaries or apostles is another way to say it. And you have found that they are not true witnesses. You've correctly found them to be false. I know you are patiently enduring and holding firm on behalf of my name. You have not become faint. Sounds like a pretty good review so far. Starting to get a little proud about this, maybe. However, <laughs> you know there's that room for improvement. Here's one of your opportunities for improvement. I have this against you. You abandon your first love. That's still true today, right? This can happen. It's not that you're, you're cold. You just got a little more lukewarm. Easter had a classic line a few years ago when we were at our old church. She was running the pr uh, prayer in the morning. Still does, you know, she's here in intercession. And, and, and they were really starting to hear the voice of the Lord. And, and then people were walking in from the parking lot, and they were talking. And the analogy she came up with, not in a condemning way, but it was like the water was starting to boil. And when you people came in, it was like pouring cold water in the pot. And again, like that could sound condemning. It wasn't. It was just a great word picture of the momentum that we get when we're all in this thing together. We're all rowing at the same time in the same direction. In the place of unity, there is a commanded blessing. When we know, that's Psalm 133, commanded blessing. So something happened to cool you off. Hmm? It's a big challenge. You know, it's a big challenge. It's one thing if Trisha and I are still on fire for the Lord, you know what I mean, if we're passionate, if we're putting our time and energy in. But what good is it to you if it's not contagious? So that's what we want. We want it to be contagious because we can't do it all, right? So you can't be depending on somebody else's faith, but you can pull on somebody else's faith and put a demand on the anointing. You know that one? That's a good one, isn't it? Why should we settle for less? No way. The devil doesn't settle for less. He tries to steal, kill, and destroy. So we should try to give abundant life to people because it's available through him, not us. We're the vessels that he uses, right? So I have this against you. You've abandoned your first love. Do you remember what it was like before you fell? That's a pretty strong word. Well, I feel judged. <laughs> Sorry. This is God speaking. It's your review, right? It's your review. This is an opportunity for improvement. Remember how it was before you started to cool off? That could sound really condemning. I don't mean it to. I really don't. I think iron sharpens iron, right? That's why we're here. That's why we worship together. That's why we, we leave room for flexibility in the schedule. Because what schedule? It's the Lord. We're coming together to experience his presence in our midst. And if one person gets healed, would you rather have that or a good sermon? The healing's more important. <laughs> Somebody gets delivered of a demon spirit, changes not only them, but everybody else in their family. Good sermons are great. We need them, right? But no, the power of God in operation is what we all need all the time. And you can't manufacture it. There's no formula for it. I do know you can sure inhibit his spirit by having a carnal, legalistic attitude. Anyway, do you remember what it was like before you fell? You were saved, but you've just cooled off. You're not going to hell, but you're no longer Navy SEALs. You've lost the heart to go out onto the mission. 
and go do another mission. The guy I met um, was the one that was in the movie Lone Survivor. His name's Marcus Luttrell. He was speaking at an event for the company I work for. I'm telling you, it was life-changing to meet this guy. The only reason he stopped is because he had been shot like 14 times. He had done 300 deployments. He was still traumatized. He had a golden retriever with him who, who knew if he got triggered because of the post-traumatic stress, the dog would jump up on him, and, and that would be his clue. He was crying that he couldn't go back. Talk about a hero. I mean, I know it was post-traumatic stress, but, I mean, when, when you heard him talk, it was just... This is a Navy SEAL, man. I'm sure glad that they are on our side. And, I, and I'm thinking that's how Paul sounded too. So it's not condemning. It's almost like you were there, right? You can go back. And, and this guy would have, except his body just stopped cooperating. He got older. He went on 300 deployments. Amazing story. We're going to stand before the Lord, right? And I don't want this to be a works mindset. It really, it could be mistranslated. It's not that you can earn your salvation. He doesn't like earning, but he does like effort. <laughs> Go ye, therefore, and make converts. Thank you. Big difference. Oh, man, big difference. A disciple is chasing after God. I'm a man and a woman after God's own heart, right? I'm not going to stop. I got a little, I got however much time I have left here. It's a limited amount. I want to get as much done for God as I can. Yes, I'll feed my family. Yes, I'll pay my bills. Yes, I'll get involved, but I'm going to live with this urgency in my mind that I've got an answer that other people need. And if I don't say it, then how are they going to hear it? <laughs> Only two more verses. It's time to rethink and change your ways. That's called repent. <laughs> Rethink and change your ways. Go back to how you first acted. However, if you don't return, I will come quickly and personally remove your lampstand from its place. I didn't put that in there. This is in the Bible. You know, I didn't add that. This is what he's saying, like fish or cut bait. You've been doing this a long time. You're expected to keep progressing as a Christian. Right? It's, it's not okay to just pull off the road and just let everybody else do. The, I don't want to say the work because it's not the work. It's the mission that God has for us. Because if you're, and I'm not saying that he's talking even about backsliding here, but if somebody is backslidden, the connection is, is almost worse than if they never knew the word because they knew what it was and now they're not doing it. So there's that extra echo of the truth coming in. Now, many people have gotten saved in that position because the word was so good in them and you're praying for them, that prodigal come home. Lord, let the word rise up in them because your word will not return void. I speak and activate the word that's in the heart of that child that's in the pigsty right now. And we say, come home. So it is good that that word is in there. Two more verses. Six and seven. But you do have this to your credit. You despise the deeds of the Nicolaitans and how they concede to evil. I also hate what they do. And our culture is conceding to evil. The church has to be the light in the midst of the darkness. Okay, if we don't say it, there's nobody else out there going to say it. Pornography industry has never been doing better than they're doing right now because people always look for counterfeit affections. Nicolaitans possibly believed in excess of freedom in matters of sexual immorality and idol worship. America 2023. <laughs> Sorry. Let the person who is able to hear listen to and follow what the Spirit proclaims to all the churches. So let's stand. Thank you for your patience and thank you for being with us when we're praying for people at the altar and we go off what we think is the normal schedule. I don't think God has a normal schedule. I think he wants every time we come together, he wants us to be changed by his power. And Mario Marilla has his great one-liners. He said, there's nothing regular about a church service. Okay. Two or more gathered, he's there. There's nothing regular about Jesus. I won't, I won't tell you the rest of that line. Might offend somebody. But we shouldn't settle for regular. We should settle for signs, wonders, and miracles. These sh signs shall accompany those who believe in my name. Cast out demons. <sighs> Stop right there. There's plenty of demons in New Jersey that need to be cast out. Let the person who's able to hear say, that's me. I'm able to hear. 
All right, so listen to and follow what the Spirit proclaims to all the churches. I will allow the one who conquers through faithfulness, even unto death, physically, but also pick up your cross daily. You might have to put some habits to death. You might have to put some relationships to death because they're too toxic. And, and you get built up and you go back and pull them out of the fire, out of the fire, right? That's scriptural. Don't let them pull you down. I will allow the one who conquers through faithfulness even unto death to eat from the tree of life found in God's lush paradise. Isn't that interesting? He goes right back to Genesis, right back to the Garden of Eden. The thing that we lost because of sin, there was no death. They were allowed to eat of this tree of life. It was the knowledge of good and evil that they weren't allowed. So let's just be humble people and realize if God said we can't handle the knowledge of good and evil, then you know what? We can't. And the world keeps trying to do it without God. You can't do it. He's smarter than we are, don't you think? He's smarter than Einstein. Jesus knew E equals MC squared before Einstein did, just in case you weren't sure. He was there at the creation of the whole universe before Abraham was, I am. I am is in you. So you could say, I am a disciple. I am a disciple of Christ. I'm not settling for less than everything that he has for me. Lord, we repeat it again. Your word is a treasure in my heart. And it defends me from sin. The truth that you've placed inside of me is going to act like a shield around me. And it, it allows me to go into dark places to bring your light into those dark places. Because we love people. And we don't want to see them bound by sin and bound by addictions and bound by lies that the culture is feeding them, even in the public schools. I hope it doesn't need to get any darker before you feel like we better do something about this. Because this is the darkest I've ever seen. it, And I'm ready. I don't know about you, but I'm ready. I'm not going to just sit around and say, well, we knew it was bad, but didn't want to try. Didn't want to lose our 501c3. I mean, I think Paul would smack me if I said that to him. <laughs> What's a 501c3, man? What are you talking about? We didn't have any tax exemption. We we're putting our lives on the line every day. Oh, but I might get fired. Good. <laughs> Go start another church. You get my point? Like, look, this is life and death. We're not talking about some light thing here. It's really serious. Spiritual warfare is real. People are committing suicide at a higher rate than ever. All this progress that they claim is happening in the culture is resulting in more turmoil. They need Jesus. Amen? They need Jesus. I see you when you're in the ICU. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Come on, fill us, Lord, to a greater measure. Fill us with more passion. If we've started to cool off, rekindle the fire in our heart because we want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. We don't want to be the ones that you're correcting that we lost our first love. Help us put aside the distractions, whatever's cluttering our lives, Lord. We want to get back to our first love because as great as the church in Ephesus was doing, there was still another step they could take. So we voluntarily say, show me. Show me what needs to go. Show me, and then I will go where you tell me to go. Here I am, Lord. Send me. I commission your people, Lord. I thank you for everyone that's here today, that they're willing to go that extra mile, to go that extra step, to be the special forces that will not quit because your work is too important here in the earth. And the same freedom you gave us, we want to see you give to other people through us. So empower us and encourage us to do it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. amen. Love you all. I said prayer, right? So if you're coming up for prayer, there's an altar right over here on the left-hand side. There's an usher at the front.